Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I have a fantastic episode for you today with bassist and educator Steve Bailey. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most fantastic artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it happen, what was their journey, and ultimately, what can we learn from them? We've already had some amazing guests who have shared some incredible stories like Larry Grenadier, Derek Hodge, Christian McBride, Rufus Reed, Justin Coughlin, and so many others. You can listen to all these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go watch them on YouTube. So go subscribe, download, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% Spun Crush Rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric, and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code Jazz15, and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York, and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10, and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, I am ready to bring you today's guest, and it is the one, the only, Steve Bailey. It was so much fun catching up with Steve Bailey. He really is a one of a kind person. He loves to talk, he loves to share, and boy has he got some amazing stories that we can all learn from. I first knew of Steve Bailey as this virtuosic, electric bass, fretless bass player, not knowing that he could do all the things that he does today. He runs the bass department at Berkeley College of Music, and he's played with everyone from Paquito de Rivera, Dizzy Gillespie, Jethro Tull, the list goes on and on. So I'm gonna keep it short. Without further ado, here is Steve Bailey. Oh, well, thanks so much for taking the time, Steve. I, I really appreciate it. No I, I know you're busy, a busy person. So this is my show. It's called The Hump with Katie. And The Hump, of course, means the beats, you know, the beat of the of the bass. It's not a, it's not an innuendo. I, I, know, I, I, I know you and I know that. <laughs> um, so I just love to, I won't take up too much of your time today, but I kind of just want to get up from point A to point B of, of Steve Bailey or point A to point Z and just kind of get a little peek into you. And uh, so I would just like to start at the beginning because you're such a, a monster on the electric bass, especially the six string, the six string bass, which is just a monster in itself. So I kind of want to figure out how that happened. So what made you choose the bass to start? Um the bass came, I was a trombone player before that and kind of during that, but, uh, uh, I was in high in junior high and a, and a guy came to me and said, do you want to play bass in our band? And I never considered it. I wasn't even sure I knew what a bass guitar, I knew what it was, but I'd never touched one or, or really given it any thought. So he said, we've got a gig in a couple of weeks and, uh, and so I went over there and played this tuned down guitar and uh, uh, he showed me three notes, which I later learned were C sharp, B and A. Mm -hmm. And he showed me a pattern that went do, 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 do. And, and then I, I realized I was playing all along the watchtower. Mm -hmm. I had one <laughs> finger plucking and one finger fingering on this tuned down guitar instrument it wasn't actually a bass and uh um uh and i left there with two little blisters on one yeah. on each foot and, and i was a bass player and I, I was hooked that was and it slowly but surely uh through a series of event, events i uh uh did that gig with them i got serious about it i want i already knew how to read bass clef so I, I wanted to learn to apply that to bass and play that in my high school band instead of trombone and uh but what really cinched it was uh i remember going into my band director's office who's a great trombone player and he's one of the guys that steered me to the college i first went to and and i said mr mack um uh, i won't be able to make the friday pep games um, cause they have a, a brass band at, at all of the, the basketball, uh, Friday night games and, and football. And, uh, he said, why? And I said, I got a gig. 
Hmm. And Tom Bone, he says, a gig? He goes, what does that mean? I said, well, I'm playing at the Spanish Galleon, this restaurant, and they're paying me $50 a night, which in 1974. That's a lot of money. It was a lot of money. There were people working all week, you know, for a dollar an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Back then, kids, you know, and, and so I was expecting him to say, you know, your loyalty's got to be with the high school and your loyalty should be with the band. And and the first thing out of his mouth, he kind of had his mouth hanging open. And he said, he said, you think they need a trombone player? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that was it. You know, I started making money. Um, I'd done my first gig just before that and met the people that would eventually ask me to play with them. And, and I'd already developed a pretty good ear because I didn't know how else to learn. Hmm. And uh, thank goodness and and i could pick up songs really quickly that i didn't know and uh and so they they brought me on that gig and and i never looked back all of a sudden i realized wow i can you can get rich playing the bass and and thank god nobody told me the reality of that either i might have backed out but but at the time i felt incredibly rich and lucky and and um and you know it it just kind of went from there one thing after another knowing it's what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life and so I put everything else that I was into surfing and and um, just about everything on the back burner and Mm. started practicing like I'm uh, like a crazy person I mean I I was just obsessed I would wake up at four in the morning on my own and just want to practice and my Mm -hmm. mom got these big clunky headphone uh things that were out in this probably 75 or 76 some of the first ones out there and and i <laughs> uh, uh so i could practice in the morning and not wake up everybody in the house because mm-hmm. we lived in a t- tiny little house and there, everything was connected so yeah i i just i thought the more i practice um the better i would get what a novel concept yeah and that that uh, that makes complete sense because to me, even as you're you know you're the head of the Berkeley Bass Department, you're ac- accomplished. You're very accomplished, but you seem when I first met you, this guy's a sponge. Any information you get, you're gonna soak it up. So that makes a lot of sense playing those those gigs at the Spanish Galleon, and you're just using your ear, soaking it up, and that kind of like sparked your interest. Okay, I'm just gonna practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I, I just like to learn stuff. I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh- it doesn't it, music that's fine it's just fun to to learn things it, it it's a drag to forget them and have to relearn them. Mm-hmm. but i guess we all go through that um uh, when we try to absorb information it's one of those things that like i read some science and and uh i'm reading this book called the life of the cell um it's it's amazing but i have to reread it three or four times because mm-hmm. it's it, kind of out of my league and, and then I get a you know it's good for my teaching because I realized doing that that people who aren't familiar with the nuances of music you know of harmony and voice leading and any kind of theory or fingerboard management or all of those things they're kind of seeing seeing that stuff like I see uh mitochondria and, yeah. and weird things like that that I, I'm I'm still I know it's important and I've read it three or four times, but I'm, I'm not quite getting it yet. So yeah, I try to, I try to keep learning something. Yeah. And, and at that time when you were first uh, playing was, what was the music you were into? What was, it was it on the radio or just like the band was bringing you? Oh yeah. I mean, it, it was what kids were listening to then. And, and it was one of the, the second song I learned was LaGrange by Mm -hmm. zz top and then we at that stage we would learn like the first part of songs and we could never figure out the rest of them so when like (laughs) lagrange up a minor third that was just whoa i'm out yeah yeah it's like let's just stick to the first part we'll repeat that and we had we we had a repertoire of songs um from leonard skinner we uh uh started on uh early Aerosmith sweet emotion but man that bass part just tripped me up really mm-hmm. I I couldn't even fathom that but you know it, it uh 
I just wanted to get better. And, and I ended up asking around and, and, uh, somebody said, if you want to learn properly, whatever that means, or if you want to learn a lot, you should get together with this guy, Jack Austin. And he was a theory teacher at the college with the college that I'm affiliated with down in, in South Carolina still to this day. Um, I, I, I called him up and, and he invited me over. And that's when I heard uh, these, this one sentence. And it was, if you really want to learn your instrument, you should get into jazz. Hmm. And uh, I said, okay, I really want to get into my instrument. So we had a record store. I said, what, what should I get? And he said, just go in and get any jazz record. Hmm. And just listening to it and, and absorbing it. So, um, I go in there and, uh, it's the record bar. And I said, you know, do you have any new jazz records that I can listen to? And, uh, I didn't even know that like old jazz was, I just said, do you have any new jazz records? And they, they said, yeah, we've got this new, new record by Chick Corea, which is timely, you know, that we're yeah. talking about now. Um, and immediately I, I thought Chick Corea, okay. Um, girl singer. And, uh, I'm looking, you know, I had no idea. Yeah. Like, and I, and I got, they, they gave me the record. It was light as a feather. I took it home. I put it on my turntable and I, I, I had a reaction. I, I mean, I just flipped out. I mean, I heard Stanley Clark. I didn't mm -hmm. know who Stanley Clark was. I'm glad I didn't know. Cause if mm -hmm. somebody he's the leading virtuoso in jazz progressive double bass i would have probably backed off and said okay i i, I don't i just thought he was another jazz bass player mm -hmm. and and i thought wow if that's jazz like i'm still studying the solo on on 500 miles high mm -hmm. and on spain and and still trying to figure some of this stuff out um Thank God nobody told me that that he was he was one of the first messiahs of of you know of modern double bass coming mm -hmm. out of Carter's and the Paul Chambers and then there all of a sudden Stanley the virtuoso kind of soloist and so that just pushed me harder to just mm -hmm. practice and so I, I always Stanley taught me so much way way before I ever met him and I tell him some of the things sometimes and. And he cracks up uh, at some of my stories about how I, he fooled me, but made me learn more than than if somebody had showed me what he was doing. Oh, of course. Oh, that's great. And you probably didn't, because no one told you who Stanley Clark was, you probably didn't feel overwhelmed or like behind. I know sometimes it's like, I have to check out this record and this person. It's just like you said, it was like, this is jazz bass. I had one jazz record. And I wore that thing out, just listening to it over and over again. Something we don't do much now, especially youth, is like really listen to a whole record and then start pulling apart songs. And and uh, and and I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the next record I got. I mean, that was enough. And and I didn't. Know. And 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 it never occurred to me that Stanley that just that's jazz bass so i'm gonna learn it and and i always tell people sometimes ignorance is bliss i mean not knowing that something is really hard is is kind of a, a invitation to learn it e easier i think mm -hmm. and when somebody tells you oh man this is going to be so hard you go in there with preconceived notions but all i heard was this flurry of notes and uh and my mom was always great, you know. She just encouraged me. Uh, anything anybody else can do, you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that. that's good too. Um, yeah, like if someone says it's going to be hard, then you're thinking it's going to be hard. But the same thing goes if someone's like, "Oh, this is easy," but for you, you know, for or for me, it might not be easy if someone gives you that predetermined notion. So that's cool. You kind of just went in it with nothing, blank canvas. I think, I think Jack was grinning. I mean maybe I learned something about pedagogy then. Um, and I didn't know the word and I, I certainly didn't know anything about teaching, but, but as I look back on it over the years and talk to him, um, 
there was a method to that. You know, it wasn't, um, I don't remember him ever telling me something was hard. Mm-hmm. Or, or this is easy or this is hard. It just, this just is. So mm-hmm. if you want to work hard enough, you can figure it out. And, and um, yeah, that's kind of stuck with me. Yeah. And I was just that album last night. And, hmm. and, and I texted Stanley, um, and knowing the pain that he's going through right now and, um, uh, you know, it, it, losing chick last week and, and revisiting this record and so many others, um, it, it's, it's tough, you know, we all knew him and, and people like Stanley and. Eddie and John Patitucci, um, Eddie Gomez, of course, and, and several others who spent so much time with him. I, I, I kind of, I'm trying, I empathize with their pain. I spent Mm -hmm. um, some time with Chick and, and got to know him as, as a beautiful person, but I, I, I I just can't imagine what, what they're all going through. Yeah. It's, it's tough and it's, I mean, I've lost, we've all lost people too. And the other side of the coin, it's hard to think of now, but it's like, well, we've got this amazing music, right? We've got the, and, and visual now, thank goodness for YouTube, but we've got so much. True, true that. And, and that's, um, I don't know if you saw when, when Rocco Prestia died, but we did uh, an online webinar in a tribute to him and had Mm -hmm. all the greats there, you know, talking about that and it was the feedback I got from even Emilio and Dave Garibaldi and all the people who worked with him and all of us who idolized him um, it was a who's who in that window Um, uh, the feedback I got was it's good to talk about Mm -hmm. it felt good to talk about him and talk about the beauty that, that he left us with and how he influenced us and we heard stories that you know, many of us had never heard, and and we heard some stories that were never told before. And, yeah, and that's great therapy. So, so I've been reaching out. Um, I was on the phone with Steve Gad yesterday and Eddie, and and I know every, a lot of people are talking about Chick now, but I'm hoping to get just a group of bass players. Lenny White is in, and and people who rhythm the rhythm. You yeah. Know, the, bass and drummers of, of what, what he, Dave Weckl is in, Patitucci's in, um, Anthony Jackson is in. So we're, we're all going to talk about Chick. I think it's next Friday. Weekend. That's cool. Cause everyone's going to have something different, a different experience. It, it's so beautiful. You know, one thing I've learned about these webinars is we've been doing them through COVID, you know, for, they started kind of out of desperation, you know, they tell us we can't be together. And we, we, I thought, you know, look at this technology. We can, we can kind of be together. And, and we all discovered that, that it was beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so we've just kept going and kept the conversation going and more and more people are interested. We've, we've got one coming up the week after that. This is kind of blowing my mind, but I started thinking of producer basis. Like yes. who, are the, who are those, you know, we had Norbert Putnam on one of ours. Who's one of the, 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 from the sixties and seventies, like produced Margaritaville and stuff like that. And is a great bass player. I thought, who, who can we, who can we get? And, and if you'd have told me 10 months ago, 11 months ago that we would have Don was and Randy Jackson, Mm -hmm. Larry Klein and Steve Rodby, um, all on the same ticket, and that's what we're doing a couple of weeks after that. Like they're all my favorite bait, Marcus Miller, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're like all my favorites and they've got some amazing insight as producers. So we're looking forward to, uh, to that kind of stuff. I mean, that, that's, that's what the, this pandemic, everybody talks about how bad it is and it is, and I don't minimize it at mm-hmm. all, but there's been so much good stuff come out of it educationally and, yeah. and technologically and, and, you know, personally for a lot of people, they're, it's tough. We're all going through shock um, from losing gigs and, and I mean, everything that goes with it, I don't even need to go into that, but we've also found things that we're going to hang just like this, what we're doing right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it would be happening if it weren't for, for the, the pandemic. 
Um, at least we would be telling ourselves, oh, let's just wait till we're together. Let's wait yeah. till Katie visits Berkeley because you can't really do it online. It just doesn't come out well. And and this is, in many ways, it's better. If yeah. People are looking directly at each other. And, and like on the, some of our webinars, we've had, when we had Tool on there and Megadeth and, and all, all of these people hanging out, we had thousands of people watching. Mm. Where it, to get it at Berkeley, we would have hundreds because yeah. the halls aren't that big. So it's there's a lot of good coming out of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, the good parts, of course. Um, sp okay, so speaking of stories, you've probably told this story a thousand times, but um, the reason why you play fretless is because you ran over your electric bass. Is this true? Who told you that? I read it several times. Oh, must be true. Yeah. Well, sadly, it is true. It's absolutely. <laughs> uh, I had gotten a fretless because I, I had heard Percy Jones first with Brand X. And then right after that, I heard Jocko. And I was like, whoa, these guys, that's a voice I like. And I think coming from trombone is what, what why it really caught hmm. my ear. Because the slide is just a a fingerboard with no frets, you know, and, and, uh, but yeah, I still like everybody else, um, didn't take the plunge because it, it, I realized, okay, I got to think about so many more things now that I've got to worry about intonation. Like mm. I can't, I can't fudge with my technique because the music's my, the, my intonation suffers. So I didn't take it on any gigs. Um, and I would just practice it at home. And, and then I w was doing this gig. And after the gig, I was in a rush to get out of there. And, and I'm backing up. A piano player is riding with me. I'll never forget. And I'm, I'm backing out of this parking space. And I feel like I hit a little bump. And I thought, I don't remember, you know, like a curb, a little curb being back there. But <laughs> it felt that like I'd hit a curb. So I just went ahead and pushed through it. And then I felt it bump again on my, my front tires and, and, and I'm thinking, wow, what? and it still <laughs> never occurred to me till, till as we're backing up, I see my gig bag laying in the park, in the parking lot. Um, and then I, that's when I realized immediately that I'd run over the base. And I'll tell you this, for those that have never ran over a base, <laughs> I do, but when you do, um, uh, but when you, you do, but when you do and you go pick up that gig bag and you stand it up straight and you hear stuff like falling through it like a rain stick, it's not a good thing. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's when, you know, of course I freaked out, but, but I also had my fretless at home and, and uh, I brought it to the gig the next night, the same place we were playing. And I remember looking over, I'm playing these songs. We're playing how deep is your love by the Bee Gees. Mm -hmm. And which has got some nice changes in it. And, and I'm singing, you know, my little background vocals and all that kind of stuff. And, and I looked over at the piano player and, and he looked like, like Herbie Hancock when Ron Carter would, would just throw in these notes. And, and he was just like, you know, had this, this look like he was in pain, but, but I, I thought, wow, yeah, this is great. He's really into it. And then later uh, I found out from him that, I was so out of tune. He was cringing at every note hmm. and really need to, to do something because, and, and, you know, I'm listening to myself sing and trying to play. And, and that's when I got serious about it because my other bass went back uh, to Stuart Spector to be repaired. It was a Stuart. I've got one of the early 77 fretted Stuart Spector NS ones when I was on the road with a, band which i at 17 and which is another story in and of itself but, but then i started playing the fretless the the part of the story you may not have read because it's a painful one to tell but literally the next year i'm at north texas and i did the same thing with my fretless oh i ran over that base and i'll <laughs> And I sent it back to Stuart Spector and, um, and he repaired it and we got it fixed. Um, and this was a little bit quicker. So I got him back and, and 
you know, five, seven years later, I'm in New York with Dizzy Gillespie playing there, playing my Stuart Spector. And you ran and it I, over it again. No, 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 no. <laughs> I called Stuart thinking uh, um, uh, I wanted, you know, I wanted him to know that I was using that bass and I was in New York and he was in Brooklyn. And uh, so I called him up and I said, I'm playing in New York uh, this week with, well, I called him up and I said, hi, Stuart. Um, my name's Steve Bailey. And before I could tell him what I was doing, he goes, Oh, the guy in South Carolina who keeps running over his bases. That's you, right? So I was already like in his head. Yeah. But for the wrong reason. That's yeah. great. No, I never over another one yet. Okay. Uh, yet. I like how hopeful you are. But but two two running over two Stuart Spectres within the span of a year, uh, that's impressive. And you could have seen that as a sign to stop playing bass, but uh I'm glad you didn't. No, I saw it as a sign to pay attention to everything going on around me because uh, most accidents happen uh, from that simple kind of not being observant. So I, I became way more observant to almost everything. And, mm -hmm. and I, I try to learn something from this. I mean, I look now I look for hazards. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm better at it. I, I uh, yeah, that was a painful le way to learn that lesson, though. I think there's easier ways. <laughs> yeah. So in the span of that, you know, five or seven years from Carolina to Texas, and then you just, you said that so nonchalantly, you're playing with Dizzy Gillespie. So what what's happening in between that time? Well, I, I was at North Texas, and uh, um, and it was great. I mean, so many people I still work with now were there um, as students, and... And I was learning so much, but the only thing I was disappointed in with the college was that they treated the electric bass like a, a you know, the proverbial redheaded stepchild. Mm -hmm. There was no electric bass instruction, and there was an, an, a prejudice against the instrument with the top bands. You had to play double bass, which I understand. Um, uh, I, I wasn't mad about it. All it did was, was push me to the university of Miami mm. and I, and, and, oh my God, there was some amazing playing going on. Gary Willis was at North Texas when I was there and a guy named Bob Parr and a guy named Alex Blair. I'll never forget those three. They were all playing fretless bass and, 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 and amazing with it. And, um, uh, so, but I wanted to study it. You know, I wanted to dig in, and I, I knew Jocko was somehow affiliated with the University of Miami, and I knew that they treated the electric bass as a legitimate instrument. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I wanted to go to Berkeley, ironically, and and they didn't give me enough scholarship. I should say we didn't give me enough yeah. scholarship. There we go. Uh, to, uh, uh, to come to school here, and, and I was convinced I would never live in the Northeast again after New York and all of that, but Anyway, I went to University of Miami, and I was so excited to study with Don Kaufman. And, and uh, uh, but even him, he, he, my first lesson, he said, you know, maybe you should bring your fretted bass, um, and then you can work on your pitch stuff. And and he goes, and I won't have to listen to you play so out of tune. And I I I told him straight up, I said, look, I just came all the way from Texas uh, to study with you, and to study this instrument. And I said, let's make a deal. I go, if my intonation is bad enough that you can't stand it, I'll bring the fretted bass, which was more motivation to play in tune, mm -hmm. practice slowly and, and really look at my fingerings and look at all of this stuff that, 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 that are ingredients in, in consistent, consistently good pitch or controlled pitch, as I like to look at it. And, um, uh, and I never took a fretted bass to a lesson. So, so for the next two years, um, I, I studied diligently. I, pl I didn't play fretted bass. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to learn fretless and double bass. I mean, I love double bass as well. And so I was studying that as well and playing, you know, around town a lot. And I got this great gig on, I had to play both basses and, and, uh, Don Kaufman recommended me as a sub on it, as he was a sub on it occasionally, but it was a five night a week jazz gig. And it was playing tunes, fusion tunes, straight ahead things. We had a singer, it was a wonderful Sandy Patton, a great singer, and 
and this band was called the Billy Marcus Quintet, and they had five nights a week for good money playing jazz, and, and this was the killer. Every other week was backing up a name artist. Mm. So I just fell into this gig in between classes every night of, of backing up Richie Cold and Sweets Edison and Lou Tabakin and Martin Murphy. And wow. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And I did this gig um, for about a year and a half straight, five nights a week. And then um, Paquito de Rivero is one of our guests. And, um, uh, and James Moody kind of back to back. They just kind of blew my mind. And I remember the end of that semester, uh, Paquito de Rivera called and asked me if I wanted to move to New York and join his band. Hmm. He liked the way I played and, he, and he, he just liked me. And and uh, I did. I, I, I dropped out of school and moved um, to New York and joined his band. And that's, that's where it really got started for me, where I realized, wow, all this practice um, – and now I'm, I'm playing with people that are much higher level than me. And, and I had no, I love being the worst guy in the band because mm-hmm. um, it, it, it makes me the student and not the teacher. And, um, uh, I didn't learn that until later cause I was always the worst guy in, in a lot of bands, but, but my goal was not to be the worst guy. In the band. My, yeah. my goal was to learn to play with Ignacio Berroa the way it should be done or Daniel Ponce or Michelle Camilo, who's eventually in the band when he moved to New York and, and all of these guys just, just forced me to up my game. Mm-hmm. That's, that's amazing. Cause it, it didn't seem like you were as much goal oriented, like, okay, I want to play with these people and that it's just like, okay, I'm going to do my best every time I play to learn. Is that cause you had this great gig. I mean, well, I got the gig, but it came, from pain because a year earlier, a year and a half earlier, um, right before I got the gig with Billy Marcus, um, I was asked to sub on this Salsa big band by George Casas, Jorge Casas, who's also at the time was in this band that was up and coming called the Miami Sound Machine. <laughs> and he, he couldn't, he had a Miami Sound Machine gig and he said, I got this other gig and he knew I was a good reader and you just assume things and I went on this gig and, and I, I read that stuff down. I mean, it was good. And, and the, at the end of the night, the trombone player, the leader, he came to me and said, Steve, you know, um, uh, this, I know it was booked for Friday and Saturday, but, but, uh, you won't be playing with us tomorrow night. Hmm. And I said, I said, what happened? Did, did we get canceled? And he, he said, <laughs> he said, no, uh, you're, you're getting canceled. And I said, why? He said, he said, you read the notes and, and, and you didn't get lost in the charts. And, and that was impressive. He said, but it just didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you didn't feel right. And, and I remember leaving that gig thinking, oh, my career is over, you know, words out. I can't play Latin music and, and I'm in Miami and what good it, that's like, you know, that's, I, I felt really bad. And, and I made a decision then I, I could just do like some people and go, Hey, screw Latin music. I can mm-hmm. play straight ahead. I've, I've studied that. I can play rock. I, I, there's plenty of other things I can do. Um, and some people would say, look at it that way. But I was like, no, uh, that means I have a lot to learn. I changed my radio to all Spanish stations, uh, playing Puerto Rican music, playing Cuban music, playing South American music. And I, that's all I started listening. To. Mm-hmm. And within it, a, a year and a half, I was playing with Paquito de Rivera. And ironically, to make this, this long story have a punchline, uh, we got a gig in Miami and mm-hmm. came back. And we're late for the gig. We show up right at Soundcheck. We walk into this hall. I look down on stage, and guess who our opening act is? Mm-hmm. And it was our home player still leading that same band. And he looked at me when I walked in with Paquito and all these guys. He was like, what? Yeah. Walking down to the stage and I recognize him and and I'm thinking, you know, there are two ways to to handle this. Yeah. The little boy from South Carolina, um, first inclination was to like, nah, 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 look at me now, you know. 
And then I realized, and I, I'd realized it before, that that guy was the one who taught me the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, if he'd have just said, you're fired and sent me home, I would, I would today be wondering, you know, I couldn't possibly be that bad. Mm -hmm. So obviously there was some, but he taught me a lesson in just a few sentences by explaining to me why he fired me. And, um, and so I walked down and I'm sure when I stuck my hand out, he, he was thinking, Oh God, what's he, what's he got planned? You know? Yeah. And, and I just said, thank you. You know, thank you for the lesson. I said, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for you. Mm. And so, you know, some lessons are harder to learn than others. And, uh, um, I am, uh, grateful for, for that one from him. And so he, he was a big teacher mm -hmm. for me. I, I don't remember his name and I, I I'm committed now. The more I've told this story someday, I'm going to find out his name. I've asked a few people because I'd like to thank him by name and, and, uh, he may still be alive, you know? Mm. Well, that seems like some of the best teachers that you've had. I mean, starting with in, in South Carolina and, the, they just tell you one sentence or they don't even say much right and you you figure it out because you're you're intelligent well i i don't know really if, if it's if it's that it, it, it's it, i think my mentality is 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 uh i'm watching a bunch of people walking by on the street out there and i'm thinking anybody in the cars walking you don't now they're not cross, that person right yeah. there i could go grab that person and learn something from them mm -hmm. i'm 100 percent convinced of that yeah. um i don't know what it would be um but but i i really think that everybody has something they can teach another person hmm. and and to me that's a, that that's huge if you can just keep that mentality even when somebody is bugging you or firing you or aggravating you there's something to be learned from that person. And, and uh, there are a lot of people I've learned stuff from uh, about what not to do. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to learn what to do. Um, I'm a big fan of, of worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like, what can I learn from this that's going to help me in a worst case scenario? Yeah. Not the best situation. Um, so I, I've proposed a lab class here in the base department called worst case scenario where we just set you up in situations that you're going to face in the real world oh, how yeah. are you going to deal with it yeah all the stuff that katie you and me and and all of our other colleagues and and peers we've most of us have learned them the hard way i'd love to take 15 weeks because there are 15 classic scenarios i mm -hmm. can create um and teach you how to react to it the way that that we probably learned the hard way or didn't get the first time or second time or third time and some people don't get those lessons ever and they wonder why they're really good musicians and they're sitting at home mm. Here, a great a great one would be um a, a showing up to a, a singer's gig and you had all the charts and now they're all different charts there's no charts and they're all different keys let's go oh, that that's a reoccurring dream I have. It's not necessarily a singer, but, but I do have that dream when I show up to a gig and, and the music is not there or, or they take the music or any number of things. Um, at one time I was driving to Orange County for a gig when I lived in LA and I always stuck my bass behind my seat in my, in my car. And I always feel it there. And, and, and I just happened to be on the 405 heading South and put my hand there and there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. So I left home in LA halfway to Orange County without a base. You become forceful <laughs> then. I did the gig. Yeah. Um, and I figured it out on the way. And before cell phones, uh, all we had were pagers back then. But by the time the downbeat happened, I, I had a base and I, I had an idea. How do you, you know, problem mm. solving probably why I took this gig in, in, at Berkeley, um, le leading a big base department like this with 20 faculty. I mean, you've been here in hundreds and hundreds of students and all of that. Uh, my job is not good fingering. My mm. job is not 
um, making sure that they're playing the right uh, passing tones between whatever chord tones they are, my job really boils down to problem solve, mm -hmm. you know, because there will always be problems, whether it is how to outline that piece of harmony and how to connect these chords or any number of things. It, it requires, in my mind, the same thinking process is like, how do I fix this? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's a big one. And, and I remember in that car, first thing that popped into my head, I need a base. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would have pulled over and called the person up and said, look, I forgot my base. I'm going to go home. I'll be two hours late for the gig. That's unacceptable. Yeah. But I already know I'm in LA. I'm in heading in orange County. There are bases. You know, it's, it's late afternoon that's working against me, but there are music stores mm -hmm. and I pulled off the road and, and I was in Long Beach, uh, South of Long Beach. And I just looked through the yellow pages for music stores in Long Beach. And I made one phone call. I told him the situation. I said, it doesn't matter. I'll buy the bass. Yeah. You now, if I have to, I'm going to return it tomorrow. Um, uh, whatever you want to do. And, and those, those people, um, at that music store trusted me, they let me take a base and I brought it back the next day and I became their customer mm -hmm. for life. If they were still open, I would still be their customer. And, and I, I worked with them. That kind of trust is amazing. And I did the gig. And I solved that problem. And, and that, that's something that students need to think about because all of us have one or two stories of where our batteries died, our instruments failed, our amps failed, our chords failed. Um, I went to the wrong place, um, <laughs> whatever, you know, there's so many problems to solve. I think, I think that, that in academia, we don't spend enough time on problem solving. We, we create the perfect environment where yeah. you've got, so we've got the PA, everything. We got a sound guy running sound for you in a classroom. You know, we make it perfect for you. Um, that I think that's doing a disservice. Yeah. Well, you just made me think of another funny class idea. Uh, take away the cell phone with the GPS, give them the wrong address. And, um, and the start time is an hour off and they have to figure it out. It's kind of like survive survivor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, there was an old comedian named Soupy Sales. Yeah. And he, I, I was in his group whenever he played in Florida. I always, his contractor always called me because I could read his stuff and I was great. New Year's Eve, we had a pickup point. We were heading up to this retirement village and, and I didn't, it was shortly after I moved to Miami. I did not know the area well enough. And I went and waited at this place for three or four hours and they never showed up and you, we didn't have cell phones. I called the number. Of course, that's his office. The manager, there was no answer there. And uh, the next morning, my phone, I drive back and went, wow, New Year's Eve, I blew it. And I yeah. drive back and the guy said, where were you? We waited for you. And, um, uh, and I explained the situation and my, I was defensive. No, I waited for you for four hours. Where were you? I said, well, I went up and, and I got off the, the freeway there. And he said, well, were you on the interstate or the turnpike? It never occurred to me that there was a difference. Yeah. From South Carolina and, and Texas, they don't have turnpikes and interstates. I never, it was my fault. I mm -hmm. didn't do my due diligence. They never hired me again. That was my last gig with them. I don't blame them. I yeah. learned a lot. Mm -hmm. Lesson learned. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, th th and those are hard lessons. But now, now you know. Yeah, but the good thing is now I can teach somebody else that lesson. Yeah, and save them. I'd rather them learn from my pain rather than have to do it themselves. Realizing that most people are going to have to do it themselves, but this may pop back into their their head when they get faced with that that dilemma. Yeah. Um, the last thing I kind of want to talk to you about, or maybe two small things, but. So you've been at Berkeley for a few years now. I think it's it was such a fantastic, so fantastic for the bass department. Um, so what was that process for you like getting to Berkeley? Is it something 
because you you really do i mean you seem like a pedagogical master a genius because well i'll get into that later but so was that an easy choice for you to want to work there um hold on one second i'm gonna let you look at the street while i close my door <laughs> I'm actually in my office, um, which is ironic for the first time doing anything out of it because we've been on lockdown for, for uh, I mean, not lockdown, but but we've been hybrid this semester and we were fully online for a couple semesters. Um, so I'm in my office, but I heard somebody out there and I closed the door because I don't have a mask on. I've got my mm. air cleaned. Um, we get tested twice a week here. It's great. Uh, I just came from testing and I was lucky. Uh, to get the vaccine. Mm, wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell people if nothing else, go out there and, and, and beat the phone up and, and just don't take no for an answer. Mm. Um, uh, there, there are places with expiring doses. If you happen to find one on the right day, just like those people in Washington or Oregon who got vaccinated on the freeway in a snowstorm because there were doses getting ready to expire. They, those scenarios do exist. Hmm. Do what you got to do because um, uh, uh, it's frustrating, I know, but but it, it's possible. And and it, it worked out for me. But anyway, back to pedagogy in Berkeley. Um, I thought I was done. After I left L.A., I had these great gigs. I was flying. Um, There's a guy walking on the street over here who was one of the original distributors of the real book. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's been around for, I can't think of his name, but people out there who went to Berkeley in the 70s know this guy and his dog. I've heard about him and his dog. Anyway, <laughs> that that I shouldn't have my window open, but, but I, and th it's amazing. But but I, I thought I was done. And I, I swore as a kid, um, I would never live in the Northeast again. I, I had, did my time in New York. Um, uh, I would never move to Boston. That's either even further north. And I was sitting in Myrtle Beach playing tennis as much as I want. I was surfing. Life was good. I had enough work and I had this artist in residence position at the, that college, the same one where I got that first bass lesson. Um, and, and I mean, I was working and everything was fine. And then I, I found out about this job and I read the job description and I thought, you know, that, I mean, it was, I think I could do that. Mm -hmm. I think I would enjoy, that. you know, I'd done enough camps with Victor that I'd organized things and I'd done these fuss on the bus kind of events or bass player live where I was the guy who brought all the bass players together and somehow uh, made it all work. And, and I was the one who was uh, not afraid to tell Larry Graham that he was too loud, mm -hmm. which he and a lot of people wouldn't do that. I was not afraid to tell somebody to lay out who was one of my heroes, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, because the worst thing they can do is just say no. But but chant, people are are surprising. Anyway, um, I, I filled out the application, but I still didn't want the job. And and I I love the South. I love being warm. I I. This is, you see the snow's getting bigger as it falls. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too excited. I'm not too excited about that, but, but, um, I was intrigued by the job. Uh, and then I, when I applied, I found out that so many people had applied for this job. My, some of my heroes, mm -hmm. you know, and I, well, I still think I'm qualified in, in certain ways. I've taught at schools. I taught at BIT. I taught at this college. I understand how academia works to a certain degree. Um, and, and I've written courses. I've created curriculum. I've, I've been part of our base camps, which was a big influence of being around Victor that much and, mm -hmm. and learn, learning about problem solving. I thought I, I, I would be a good candidate for the gig, but I didn't want it. I just wanted to see if I could get it. <laughs> to be honest with you, it was like, like I'm, I probably won't get it, but maybe I'll get in the final round. And I did make the final round. They go through these, these rounds, and and uh, uh, I came to Boston fully, um, 
fully ready to not get the job. Mm-hmm. Mentally? I, I, I didn't want the job. <laughs> I just, I, I wanted, I don't know what I wanted. I just, mm-hmm. it was a challenge to get this job. But I still love my situation. I'm in Boston. This was April when I came up. It was kind of warm that day, which was a good omen. If it had been like this outside, I, I, I think I would have just mentally deflated. But I went to my hotel, which is right around the corner. Um, the dean asked me if I wanted a tour of the college. And he said he would send somebody over and they would could show me around. I said, you know what? Nah. Um, I do want to look at the college, but I don't want a guided tour. I just Mm -hmm. want to go over there and get a feel for it. And I found out this is where the base department is. Um, And and I, I came over here and it was late in the day. Everything was the uh, rich Appleman wasn't here. And I'm walking through this lobby right outside there. And this bass player um, student came over and he said, he said, "Are, are you Steve Bailey? And I said, yeah. He said, well, are you playing in town? Is there any way we can come hear you? And I said, no, I'm just up here visiting. I didn't want to tell him, you yeah. know, I'm just visiting. And I never really looked around Berkeley. And he said, uh, do you want me to show you Berkeley? And my first impulse was no. I, mm-hmm. I, I just do. And then I thought, wait a minute. I, want, I do want to see the student's perspective of Berkeley. Because anybody from the top down is going to, take me to all the spectacles and stuff like that. And this is Berkeley and this is that, but a student may give me a little different perspective. So I did, he took me, he took Mm -hmm. me on a walk through, through the 150 building where I got completely lost and turned around and I heard people playing um, and practicing and, and he didn't take me to any of the fancy stuff. He took me, Oh, there's this session going on way downstairs. Come look at the studio, you know, and we went down there and I checked that out and I was kind of, wow, this is pretty cool. And we walked around and, um, and, but I, that night after, even after he left, I went back to the 150 building and I stood outside on the, on the, the, by the door, I had my hat pulled down and my coat pulled up and I just sat there and I listened and, and I heard some of the most amazing things coming out of people's mouths as they walked out. Oh man, did you hear Herbie Can- Hancock's new thing? I, I I'm, I'm going to do that someday. Or everybody was just talking about. So I guess that's just what they talked about: their aspirations and and their mm. goals and their enthusiasm. And then I felt it. I got this this like this energy vibe from them that I hadn't felt since I was in college, where everybody's churning to to go somewhere, to be something, to mm. to. Whether even they even believe it or not, they're saying it. This is what I want. This is, and and uh, I remember I I went back um, to the hotel and I I called um, my wife and I said I said you know how I'm kind of ambivalent about this whole thing. I said I said I've changed. I said if I don't get this job, I'm going to be really disappointed. So it just happened like that. It was like walking back to the hotel. I was like, wait a minute. This is like, this is like a whole new world. And Mm -hmm. I was realizing, you know, 20 base faculty, hundreds of students, a chance to actually put a thumbprint on, on something way bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, yeah. And, and I went into my interviews with a whole different attitude the next day uh, with this kind of enthusiasm that I didn't have the day before. And I didn't tell them. You know, I until later that I I actually showed up. I didn't want the job, and uh, that that that's kind of cocky sounding in a way. Uh, so I I I I've told the story later. You know, and and all to teach a lesson is that is that never say never. You mm-hmm. know, even if you you're sure you don't want something, go experience it. In fact, even if if when you're sure you don't like a certain kind of music, listen to that music more. When you're sure you don't like a certain person, get around them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You might, you might, it's always surprised me. So uh, I, I say my story as a lesson, you know, the, 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 um, and I didn't plan on it and I got the job 
And then I was like, Oh, uh Oh, now what do I do? Yeah. And, uh, and, and boy, it was, it was, I'm still learning stuff, you know, about Berkeley, a college this big, um, with this many students. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like, you know, our department is larger than the 10 next major music school based departments combined. Yeah. So just, just the, the, and, and size, you know, the size of the, the college doesn't make it better. I, mm-hmm. I, I tell that all the time, but what the size of the college does is make better things possible. It makes it where, where, when people are in town, they want to come to Berkeley. Yeah. And you're in town, Katie. You want you came over, you did some stuff for us. And and that's that's without fail. So I saw an opportunity. Um to, I mean this sounds weird. I saw a real opportunity to bring um one of the strongest academic things I had, which was my Rolodex. Yes. Back in the day, is is my contacts and the people I've worked with I think I can bring a new dimension to this because I've been out there in the trenches like you doing it. And, and, and I want to bring even more of that. And there were already was a lot. There are people Mm -hmm. here working a lot and great faculty and and chairs doing things. But I thought, I thought mine, mine may be a little different for the base department. And, and it was, and, and it's been like that. Um, uh, let me see if I can I show you one thing that's so cool. And your name's on here too. But but this. Oh yeah. This. That was a blank cabinet like that when I first got here. And instead of signing the wall, I had people start signing this. And I said, when I get to the bottom, it may be time for me move on i mean i don't know if in slow motion you slow it down there are so many all of my heroes are on here all the way down at the bottom there's anthony jackson and ron carter and and, i mean it's it's just it's crazy but for me that that's really the part of of one part of being at berkeley that that has been so much fun of of hanging making music with these people, bringing their influence to the students, um, which is so valuable because that's what being big allowed us to do. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. As opposed to a small college in a uh, um, non-urban environment, we're in Boston and and we're Berkeley. I mean, Victor Wooten tells a story. One of the, his highlights of being here now that he's been on the faculty now for quite a few years was going into the Megadeth ensemble rehearsal where they study Megadeth, which is, if you can transcribe all that, uh, you you can pass out of ear training. I yeah. mean, it's amazing. But going in there and watching this, this ensemble rehearse and the whole band, Megadeth, coming in to check it out. Mm-hmm and Dave Mustaine emerging as a teacher as he started to show these students how he wrote the songs and all of that. And, and I looked at, I watched that and I thought of countless other, uh, where we have John Clayton here for a week and we've got Patitucci and Victor Wooten here every month for a week, Mm -hmm. year in and year out. And all the guests like you and everybody on that, I'm like, wow, this is, this is, we're throwing some spices into this stew that that are, are rare for people. Yeah, um, whereas, like you're saying, a smaller school, maybe one of those things might happen once a year. I remember the three years I was at North Texas, I remember the two clinics I went to. Mm-hmm. And guess what? They were the only two base clinics in three years. Yeah. They were Dave Holland and Mark Johnson. <laughs> Mark, recent graduate who is now playing with Bill Evans. Yeah. And of course, Holland was Dave Holland. And I remember them like they were yesterday. And I thought, and, and, and it was mind blowing. So really, part of my goal is, is, is to take the department that Rich Appleman grew into 
what it is and so amazingly and and I want every base student that comes in here to get their minds blown mm-hmm. academically musically it, it's it's all about that it's like I want to blow your mind and make you want to go practice it so much um and and you know these days with 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 the internet and all of the the good and bad of it and all the saturation of energy, it's harder to keep people's attention. It's harder yeah. to keep people's attention when they can go click on Spain and get 18 different versions of it. And I'm telling them, no, listen to the original version over and over again. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we bring in other people, a lot of other people that tell the, the same stories, the same musical stories that our faculty tell, but sometimes it's it's great to hear it from from somebody who you listen to all the time. Um, music yeah. Speak. Well, and my, my mind was certainly blown. What Last time I was there, I sat in, Victor Wooten had his woodshed class, where I love anybody's welcome. I loved that. And he was like, it was something like, okay, today we're just going to jam out on, um, you know, in 17, eight, 17 over 8, and uh you know we're in g flat so and there was a violinist there was a percussionist and i was just back there just soaking it up it was amazing yeah the the woodshed you should see the syllabus for the woodshed and 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 i drew it up just as kind of a joke but <laughs> the learning outcomes as we all need as we all know we need to have in a, in a in, at the top of most syllabi um there's one bullet point i like to see about seven or eight for mm-hmm. many courses and, and upon successful completion of this course blah 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 the the one learning outcome for the Wooten woodshed is to leave a better musician than you walked in as mm-hmm. that's simple like i love vicks he can simplify things um and and really make it that simple uh, you're just gonna come in and be a better musician when you walk out the door mm-hmm. we have to do and that's the way Vic rolls. It's like whatever, whatever you're gonna leave if 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 you want to a better musician. And yeah. Uh, really, yeah. So that day was seventeen eight. You never know what it's gonna be. The another day may be the baseline from a thrill is gone, mm-hmm. and the simplest baseline in the world of making it feel good. Another day, Jeff Coffin may be in town. Mm-hmm. And another day, Dave Matthews Band may be in town, and you got in that woodshed half a Dave Matthews band hanging out with Vic or you, you know, all of our artists love to hang. Yeah. I love it. I love what you've, um, you have put your thumbprint on the bass department. So, and I I absolutely love it. Everything you're doing there and especially all the, the zoom, you know, everything you're doing on zoom is amazing. So the last thing I want to just go over is that the most recent record you put out Carolina, is uh-huh. is so so awesome i was just listening to it before before we talked um what was what was the inspiration behind putting that together how did that come come to be well th- that album um i thought i could finish it while i was at berkeley hmm. and and i thought you know i can just because i i did that for the the track with howard levy was done actually in 2011 I think and I thought you know I'm just going to chip away at this while I'm at Berkeley I have all these artists coming in and and I'd been at Berkeley at that point at seven years and I realized I still well I, I mean, I'd been constantly realizing that I'm too busy to re- you, I mean, you know what it's like to make an album. It's it's not okay. I'm just gonna three o'clock today. I'll work on a little bit. I'm gonna do this. And I mean, I knew what I wanted to do, um, and and I realized okay, I'm gonna take a sabbatical. I'm gonna leave mm. Berkeley for months, and that's gonna be my goal to do a new solo album or to finish it, which meant I had one half of one track in the can and <laughs> and so I, I i just knew i had to have time and and i knew i wanted it to be duets because my last the album before that was all solo bass and uh uh and i thought you know i just want to sh- i want to play supportive bass for people 
And, but I want to do it in a way that, that hopefully is a little different and, and kind of have my, whatever my voice is, um, kind of a chemistry experiment with one other person. Let's mix it up and see what comes out. And I realized, and I, and I made my wish list of, of, of 17 people. And I figured out of 17, I'm going to get 10 or 11 that can do it. And, uh, and how many tracks are on there? 17. 17. And I just squeaked in under the limit. We're doing vinyl. It's got to be a double vinyl because I can't let any of them go. They're all like children. They're, they're bigger names on some tracks than other tracks, but, but I love them all. Um, and, and that's what it took. It, it, I thought making a duet record might be easier, but then I realized with 17 different people, that 17, and I was going to them for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, I had a traveling recording studio set up. We recorded Willie Nelson, uh, in a bar in Austin, in his bar, mm -hmm. I should say with a studio right next to it, his studio. Yeah. But we, I thought we're better. Where is Willie Nelson? Probably the most comfortable. Everybody's comfortable in a bar. I don't even drink. And I was comfortable in yeah. there. And I listened to the sound of this room and I thought, you know, I had a, about an hour to get set up before he got there. I said, I'm going to set up right at the bar, put a bar stool beside my, my U87, this beautiful mic that just sounds great on everything. And, uh, and that's where we, we recorded it, uh, sitting in a bar and we did Mike Stern's guitars in his apartment in New York city mm. uh, with, with, the, with us in one room. And uh, I'm waving at this crazy student out here who, who transcribed all of Ron Carter's Nefertiti, and uh, and I, I owe him a T-shirt for that. Anyway, uh -huh. rest. But my, yeah, Mike Stern, we had his amp set up in his bedroom, and we recorded from the living room. And and um, uh, Becca Stevens, we did in one open room at the power station because the apartment that I was using in New York, my brother's apartment, there were construction going on downstairs and you know how that can be oh yeah so wow look at this look at the, look at it now oh it's really coming down yeah yeah it's it's great but um but yeah i mean that's the concept of the album is duets and and in the end um uh when i got willie i was right at the end uh of of the process and and still ian anderson from Jethro Tull had not sent it. He kept saying he was going to do it. And I said, I'll fly there and I'll mm -hmm. help you. He's the only one that, uh, I wasn't there for the recording. Mm -hmm. And he said, Steve, he goes, I'll, I'll just be off tour. I'll get to it. You know? And, and I, I had given up on it and mm -hmm. my drop dead deadline was new year's day. And, uh, and I'd gotten Willie a couple weeks before that. And I thought, you know, I'm okay. I, 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 I'd gotten spoiled by the idea of everybody saying yes and pulling their thing off. I woke up New Year's Day and I looked in my email and and it Ian, there was an email there and it said your song on it. I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna open it and he's gonna tell me he just hadn't had a chance and and I opened it and there was an MP3 there and then I think, well, maybe he left my original MP3 of the track yeah. there. And I played this thing and I said, this is the best New Year's I've ever had. And, uh, and that was that bore. So then I knew I was done recording and, and, uh, now I got to mix all of this and somehow make it cohesive, uh, which is hard. I found out how hard that is with, with such diverse, everything from Bakiti to Susan Hagen yeah. playing Bitsky in there and trying to, trying to make it all work together. But, but yeah, I mean that, 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 uh, it's surprising, um, the different, I guess, demographics. I mean, it, it was fun. I got to say to turn on serious radio to the Tom Petty channel and hear Lucas Nelson and my version of Mary Jane's last dance being played on the Tom Petty channel yeah. and then to over to Willie's roadhouse and and hear angel flying too close to the ground on that and then and then go to the classic rock stations and all of a sudden they're playing well have you heard this duet 
of Bore, which Ian recorded on the Stand Up album in 1970, a redo of it with just bass and flute. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. So they, they helped me, even though I've worked with all of them over the years, it's been on their projects, but, but they really helped me expand my, uh, my, um, horizons in, in kind of a cool way, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I love the, the record thematically. It's like, it's like when you watch a really great movie, it's got, got an arc and I can imagine how not difficult, but just different it is they're all very different duos or different people different feels so just even putting that together that yeah, the, I, anthony, the anthony jackson track i mean that's one of my favorite it's like a a through composed composition that that anthony and and i gotta tell you um uh it we just jammed a bunch and then i got my editing uh uh, chops out and went to town on that thing. And I played it for him. Anthony never likes anything. I mean, and, and, and he'll tell you that. I mean, he doesn't listen to the stuff he does. I mean, we've had some webinars with him where he's heard some Steely Dan that he hadn't heard since the day he recorded it. He's just that way. Yeah. And when you're that, you can be that way, I guess. But, but I played that duet with him and I looked at him knowing that if he disapproved, I wouldn't put it on the album. And, and I had already had it transcribed. I said, Anthony likes to see, he likes to see what's going on as well as hear it. And, and he gave me his thumbs up at the end. He goes, that's, that's really good. I don't remember it being that good when we did it. And, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much different kinds of stuff on there and, and, and every song kind of has a story because it's just me and one other artist. Yeah. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about that. It seems like we I've gotten so busy in COVID um, and running the department online and these other projects. Have you noticed that we are busier? We're not, we don't have any gigs, everything, our lives have been turned upside down and somehow we've all found a way to be busier than we've ever been. It's I just, think cause, cause we're available 24 seven now. We, yeah. I mean, we, we, we have this, we call it the ABC. It's the academic base council. And it's a group of people who all my goal, my original goal was to get 10, 10 of the top base departments early on to talk about how we're dealing with the pandemic. How are we using technology to, to deliver our, our, our lessons and things like that. And, and it's evolved into this thing. Um, we got to have you come and guest and hang out with us one night, but it's about 15 people ranging from Ron Carter to Steve Rodby, all who teach at a college. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the prerequisite is you got to have a studio of bass players and, and want to hang. It's turned into a Thursday night hang mm. where really we talk about everything from who's gotten the virus and, and all of this to, to like last night, we all met and John Clayton is a part of it. And, and usually, you know, I'll pick on Ron Carter. I'll find some obscure tracks and we'll all listen to it together at these, at the end of the meetings after business is done, when the, when the fun starts and, <laughs> and have Ron talk about, you know, seven steps to heaven or, or all of the thousands of records he's done. But last night was John Clayton night. And, uh, and to have Ron Carter and, and everybody listening to John on a couple of tracks, one of which Victor picked and John picked one that he was on with Ron Carter and we listened to it together. And it's just amazing. And, and we all laugh about it because it's Thursday night at eight o'clock and yeah. nobody, nobody has a gig. So we're available to get busy with something else. And it, it's a, I got to say that that's one of the highlights of my week is knowing that I'll look in there and I'll see Lynn Seaton from, from North Texas and I'll see Jeff Campbell and I'll see John and I'll see Steve and I'll see uh, Roy from Belmont and, and Tim Smith and, and Chuck from university of Miami. It just goes on and on. Pete, Peter Dominguez. I mean, I, I I should stop mentioning names because I'll forget somebody and, and feel bad about it. But 
but uh, yeah, you should come in some night. It, it's just, it's a fun hang and it's educational. I mean, we have struggled together. Mm-hmm. We, I, I said, I noticed last night, I said, imagine 10 months ago when all we were doing in these meetings was panicking and complaining and about how are we going to deal with this? How are we going to get through this? And I said, look at us tonight. We're listening to each other's music, which is like a fairy tale mm-hmm. to play my music and have Ron Carter and Victor Wooten and John Patitucci, everybody listening to it and wanting to hear a story about it. Yeah. And that's the, we, we play a song and we got to tell a story about the making of that. So it, it's, it's who would have thought that something like that would come out of COVID. And I said, I said, we were panicking 10 months ago, you know, 40 meetings ago and, and what interface to use? How can, I can't hear my students. They can't hear me. How do we fix this? What's the best platform, you know, then into the disease part of it, you know, has anybody gotten this? Are you worried about teaching? How are you protecting yourself? How are you staying safe? How are you changing bases or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, we got, and then last night, we didn't have much to talk about other than listen to each other's music and, and the same people are there digging it. So it's, 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 it's beautiful that, that, that way, what COVID has brought us, which will continue, you know, we'll all get busy, yeah. you know, but, but hearing Bob Hurst last night talk about making oceans 11 and, and 12 and the soundtracks from that, that are so amazing mm-hmm. that we never knew or hear Ron Carter talk about how he negotiated with Creed Taylor um, when they were making all those incredible CTI records back then, we learned something that I never knew Mm -hmm. that Creed took the rhythm section tracks and then wrote those arrangements around what Billy Cobham and Steve Gadd and Ron Carter and all of them did. I thought that, that not Creed, but, but the arrangers wrote those that, 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 um, uh, all those amazing arrangers that wrote that music did it from, from rhythm tracks. Yeah. And I thought the home scoring all this stuff out, like, like the way Ron Carter bass note reacts with that chord, like, like all of that had to be orchestrated and Ron, uh, hip this to the, and I'm sure it's common knowledge, but it never dawned on me that, that all of those arrangements were built around mainly these guys improvising over yeah. the song. I love that. Tells a story. I want more money. And as simple as that. Creed Taylor is like, well, how much more? And Ron said, double. And Creed Taylor goes, okay. So as a result of Ron going in there, everybody the next session got paid double scale or whatever they were, whatever mm-hmm. they were. Doing. It's just fabulous to learn stuff like that and. And I don't think you learn that kind of stuff. Um, I guess you can through interviews, but mainly just sitting around talking yeah. about the situation because because nobody may, may have ever asked him that question. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, never occurred to me. I would never ask that question in an interview. Like, what came first, the chicken or the rhythm section? Yeah. I mean, it just... You know, so we we have a lot of fun. I, I I I talk too much. I'm sorry, but I get excited. No, it's it's cool. Um, uh, I'll I'll end with this. I even though you, I like you're prepared. Your or worst case scenario. I like, but to me, it comes off as you're fearless. You're a fearless person. You just want to, hey, I want to learn this. I want to do that. Like you're saying, that person over there can teach me something. So I think that that has permeated especially through the base department at Berkeley I mean there's just of course from the faculty but the students they're just on fire um and speaking of fearless the last thing I'll say is I one of my favorite videos on YouTube is of you playing with Francois Rabat um and you guys it's at um at at a base somewhere in in Europe you'll remember but he just starts playing I don't know if you guys talked ahead of time but he just starts kind of playing and it turns out to be um I'm beginning to see the light and you just it was just like this beautiful moment that maybe where we weren't supposed to see but I'm glad somebody filmed it and I to me that's just completely fearless like one of the world's greatest musicians and then who happens to play bass and you just you're right there well um I thank you for that I I think I take a little different look at it. 
to me, fear is a teacher. And all it's telling me, and I'm not fearless. I, I am definitely not fearless. I, I'm scared a lot of the time. But the one thing that I'm not scared of is to ask a question, whether it's musically or, or um, hey, Mr. Carter, uh, k- k- do your imitation of Ray Brown. Like, yeah. Hattatushi's like, you can't ask him that. And, and I went, well, what's the worst thing he can say is no. Mm-hmm. And we got the best Ron Carter ray brown imitation ever ever live on the so i'm I'm not afraid to ask people things and i think that's one way that and i'm not afraid to to talk that maybe i might be afraid to talk to them and tell them hey maybe you're too loud maybe we can turn down here maybe maybe lay out in this section and and i'm not afraid to do that because the worst thing they can do is just keep playing through it and it's still going to be okay Mm -hmm. And, and So I think fear, um, uh, the way I look at fear is that there's the fear that freezes you in the headlights, the deer in the headlights, classic. And there's also fear that you do amazing things. Mm -hmm. And you're not running from the situation, or you may be, but fear the same fear that freezes you in the headlights, it, it's adrenaline. Mm-hmm. Fear creates adrenaline in your body. And, and, and that's that fight or flight um, syndrome, or you just freeze from it. And, and I've, if, if I've learned nothing else is when I start to feel that coming on. And I felt it with, with Francois. I mean, he's one of my heroes. And all of a sudden, I'm standing there. I go, all right, here you are. You are scared. You don't even know this song. Yeah. You know the melody, and but I, I can't remember the last time I played that. And, of course, there was no rehearsal involved. And when you look back, and Francois Raboff is just smiling at you with that smile that he has, it, you, I knew it was going to be okay mm-hmm. because my ear is good enough. I, and I'll say this. Fear without skills is dangerous. Um. I should say overcoming fear without skills because you can be fearless. And if you don't have a good ear, it's going to be, it's going to be not so good. It's like a a bull in a China shop kind of thing. Um, So I think knowing that I have some skills, knowing that I've worked on things um, gives me the courage to, to like confront that fear and go, okay, I'm going to use that adrenaline now and I'm going to hear everything he does. Mm -hmm. I do or not it's the same thing that would make me go no i don't want to do that uh because i i feel this thing and i'm like freaking out but i take that thing that freaks me out and and somehow have, have practiced it and it's something anybody can practice turning it into action and uh but thank you for for francois i mean he is such a a beautiful spirit like and people like that people like chick korea and stanley and and victor and they can just make you feel comfortable yeah and and make you like the way vic put it about chick he goes i learned from chick that i can borrow his confidence in me Hmm. when i might not have it and if francois is looking at me smiling and and um uh he's telling me that it's going to be okay, mm-hmm. you know? And so I'm going to borrow that feeling from him. It's it, funny. You mentioned, mentioned him and, and, you know, just this morning, I, I have an email from Gary Carr, another one of my like yeah. time, like one of my, the, well, the first solo bass album I ever bought, forget about Jocko or any of that. I mean, Raboth, the sound, I mean, it, it just kind of blows. I mean, not Raboth, Gary Carr. Um, uh, and we're collaborating on some stuff. He's mm. sending acts and, and, and I'm scared. Like this is <laughs> Gary freaking Carr. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm, but I'm borrowing his confidence in me because he, he's gung ho. He's positive. 
and and he's like, hey, here's this song. Which jazz singers do you listen to? Let's listen to some of the same, and I'll try to phrase like, all right, if you yeah. believe, I believe that you believe, so therefore I believe. Yeah, and, and it's kind of that 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 idea of uh, the great drummer Mel Lewis would say. Um, I think I was talking actually with the bass player John Goldsby, and and Mel told John, "You're not going to sound bad playing with me." You're. You know, some people, they just have that level of confidence and they're amazing musicians. And so when you, uh, you're an amazing musician, but when you feel that from someone else, it just raises your game. Yeah, yeah. And 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 people like Mel Lewis um, or, or Victor Wooten, or they have the ability, it, they can make anybody they're playing with sound great. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that. And, and I learned that from Jake Hanna, mm-hmm. the straight ahead jazz drummer in LA. Um, I was worried about my swing feel, especially playing with Jake. And he said, man, he's just, he's just get on, uh, get on the train and ride it. He says, listen to my ride symbol. And just, just, that's all it took. I forgot like he, that you played with him. I definitely forgot that. Oh man, he was a, a great teacher. He was the most sarcastic, sardonic, dry, uh, uh, man. but he, he taught me so much. And, and what was so funny about Jake Hanna is like, if he had known that I was playing a heavy metal session that afternoon with ripped jeans and my hair down everywhere and just rocking out, he would have fired me on the spot. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. He, he had no patience for anything that didn't swing and, I, and that, well I yeah i know i there's uh i've heard many stories but i used to play uh this guitar player he passed away last year barry's Weig, and they were just playing you know a gig and oh, um barry. yeah barry and he's he asked jake Hanna. he's like um can we play a bossa and jake just goes nope he wouldn't yeah. even play play uh, play a bossa and, and the way you say nope is just like the way he would say it. He would go, nope. And uh, <laughs> wow, Barry, I didn't know Barry passed. In fact, he subbed on that gig. Um, uh, Doug McDonald was hmm. the regular guitar player in that trio usually. And I didn't know Barry had passed. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I learned I had a regular gig with him for almost two years and I learned so much. Just not not just songs, but like what to do, you know, what, what I was supposed to do. Barry Zweig was hilarious. Am yes. I wrong? No, you're, I mean, you're not. He's one of those people that you just look at him and you start laughing yeah. and um, you're not laughing at him. You're just, everything he did was hilarious. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I'll never forget him. Wow. Hmm. Well, yeah, so I'm, fearless. I'm scared. I'm scared to drive in the snow, but I, I have experience now and I'm confident. If this yeah. had been seven or eight years ago, I, I would have, you know, looked for tire chains and there's not even any snow on the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I, I, I grew up in Los Angeles and when I went to Berkeley, all I had, I had a sweatshirt. That was it. And, um, I'm glad I, I lived. Yeah. That, that was hard for me. And I'm glad I lived in 150 cause they have the practice rooms where you live. I don't know if they still do. So I didn't have to go anywhere. And uh, yeah, it was it was tough for me. I mean, especially like for your instrument too, just yeah. m- moving the bass around. But yeah, the, these winters, um, I, I haven't left my double bass here. It's at home, but but I was sitting at this desk one time, and I've got this nice old flat back. And it was right back there, and and it's winter time, and I'm sitting there, and I hear this, and I'm like, what in the heck was that? And I mean, it was a sharp pop. It wasn't a sound effect out of my speakers. Something snapped, and I'm and it never occurred to me that that was my bass cracking. I'd never heard a bass. The make. same thing happened to me at Berkeley. Uh, oh wow! So you've yeah. heard that crack before? I know. I was. Uh, it was in my room, and it was on the shoulder, and it was it was a, a good foot at least, and it just went yeah. the same exact thing. I was like, "What the heck was that?" <laughs> Until you go to play the instrument, it's going. Bzz, 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 bzz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's terrifying. Um, back to the fear. Okay. 
Steve, this was great. I'm not going to take up more of your time. I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your story. This was really illuminating. I'm glad to have learned more about you. And I, I know it's going to help other people too, just hearing it. Thank you for doing it. And, and, um, and I look forward to, uh, what's that song? When we're together again someday here at Berkeley. Yeah. Um, we'll get a, a follow-up signature on, on my, my cabinet here. Yeah, I would love that. Um, and thank you for everything you're doing. You, you've got that the Berkeley Bass legacy going. I love it. Well, we're, we're it's a it's an adventure every day, and uh, and and hopefully we'll all be back on campus, and and people like you will be visiting campus again, and and whatever our new normal will be uh, will be a beautiful thing. So. That's right. Exactly. Well, thank you, Steve. Really appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your day out there. Be safe. I will. I will. Life is good. I, 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 I'd I, rather be looking at the beach, but, you know, nature is nature. And I guess snow is all the yuck, yucky part of it. The part of it, yeah. Well, wonderful. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I'll be in touch. I love it. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out with a view of... Oh, my I, goodness. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks. Well, I just my my, my switch.